Jeremy. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to this incredible special Prodigy Season 2 episode of 10 Forward. I am, of course, your host, Mike Overton. And joining me in my co-host seat this week is my dear friend from Trekking Up North, Captain Michael Adam Goodwill, a.k.a. Mike Number 2. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mike Number 1. We have this joke every time. I'm Mike One, he's Mike Two. Uh, sounds like a stage event. Anyway, um, and I am delighted to welcome two incredible people to the show. We have Erin. I'm going to forget. I'm going to butcher your surname now. It's okay. <laughs> Give it a go. Give it a go. Erin <laughs> Mc McNamara. Close. McNamara. Close. McNamara. There we are. That's because it's the MC. Yeah, that's what it is. I know. I know. Um, so Erin McNamara, who is a screenwriter and staff writer on season two and a returning guest to the Clone Star podcast, the wonderful Jason Meyer, who is supervising animation director. Guys, thank you so much for joining the two mics this week. <laughs> yeah, thank you for like having us. I only like podcasts with two people named the same name. So thank you. And yes. we're both into Star Trek. How weird. And we both live at opposite ends of the country as well. Love it. Yeah, bizarre. So we're both handsome. <laughs> exactly. yes very true yes so before we dive into all the nitty-gritty about season two can both of you just give us a little outline of what your jobs actually entail so let's start with Erin well my job from season one to season two changed just a bit because the Higmans actually brought me in initially as the writer's room assistant in season one um, but then they graciously gave me an episode to write in season one, and that turned out to be 119, um, one of the finale episodes, which, Jason, I'm sure you helped with all those pew, pew, pew ship battles. It, it was yes. super fun. Um, so that was a lot of fun and a great experience. And then the Hagmans bumped me up to staff writer for season two. So I got to be involved. Well, I got to listen and um, be part of the conversation for season one. But in season two, I got to actually get my hands on a few more episodes. And um, so, yeah, just writing, taking notes, writing, taking notes and all of that. Awesome. And Jason? Yes, yeah, so my history was on season one, I was uh, hired as an animation director um, to, you know, just day to day, look at all the animation, make notes, um, you know, uh, supervise that side of it. And then um, I realized I had to jump in as, as, you know, my old trade as an animator, um, because I wanted to make sure that the sequences felt, you know, really action-packed and you know felt like star trek um and not just in name only but in feeling and tone and everything so um we they hired me some uh a couple animation directors um cj and jd and uh i just i i became supervising what am i yeah cg supervising director and um my God, I might sneeze. How? Why? Why wouldn't my body sneeze during a podcast? Um, why it's the this summer. This is a it's betrayal. Uh, in my, I think I pushed it down. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think I willed it away. Yeah. So uh, most of season one, I was, uh, you know, kind of, you know, animating shots, ship shots, doing retakes, um, you know, fixing cameras while also supervising the supervisors and then season two that's pretty much all i was doing was um animating ship sequences uh doing retakes you know uh working with patrick and ben and you know it just it was just a team effort to uh to get this thing on on the ground so that's basically what i what i was doing so safe to say jason you are a ship nerd I am a ship. Well, I am a motion. Nerd. <laughs> okay, motion. Nerd. So, what is my, your favorite? I was gonna say, sorry. What is your favorite ship to animate? Well, the Protostar. Uh, yeah, wait, yes. Yeah, no, Akira a class doesn't count. Goodwill does it not does, count. It does. It's no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Honestly, I love it. It felt, although it wasn't the original Voyager, it was an honor to to animate the Voyager, the new Voyager. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my I, I have a little bit. Of, I said this on the last podcast, but I'll say it again, that my history with Star Trek goes back to 1998, 1999. The first uh, 
the first company I worked at was Foundation Imaging, and they were doing effects for Voyager and Deep Space Nine when I showed up as a yep. tape operator was my title. And I would take all the footage from Paramount, uh, digitize it, put it on the server for the animators to work on. So I was indirectly involved with Voyager and Deep Space Nine back then. Um, but not as an artist. So, and I was always, I always wanted to have a shot on screen for those shows. And now I got way more than I bargained for. <laughs> and, <laughs> and got, you know, uh, a crap ton on um, Prodigy season one and season two, which I'm super proud of. And so. to be fair, those, all of the ship sequences in season one and season two are stunning. So, hat off to you, Jason. Thanks. They really are a work of art. Um, Aaron, so obviously we just briefly, Aaron, um, Jason just briefly touched on how he got into uh, Prodigy. How did you get your role within Prodigy? Well, my pathway has been a little bit odd compared to the typical pathway into writing. And I only mean that I started working as on-set PA when I was in college. And so actually the bulk of my experience has been working in production. And I did do some shows in post-production because I wanted to learn more about the exact nuts and bolts about how things are done in what order and why. So I started as a PA, became a coordinator. I eventually became a line producer and was working on smaller projects, but including small world moment. I did a music video with the Daniels who just won an Academy Award last year. So it's just like, wow, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's a good sign. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, just kind of a mix of pretty much all live action projects. Um, and in post-production, same thing, all live action projects. Um, but over the years I was always wanting to pursue writing, but it was something that I was pursuing in my free time um, in between production and post-production gigs. But I just kind of stuck with it. And then I eventually uh, finished a pilot and it was a sci-fi genre. And I reached out to just all the professionals that I knew and said, hey, would you be willing to read it and give me notes type of thing? And some of those people were the Hagmans that I had met through their cousin in like a very non-Hollywood way. But I had met them. They're from Oregon. I'm from Oregon. So we kind of hit it off. And they're obviously so incredibly friendly. And they were nice enough to say, yes, send us your pilot and we'll get back to you in a few months. And I thought they were kind of politely blowing me off. But <laughs> um, actually, a few months later, they read it and they got back to me and they had some really encouraging things and wonderful things to say. And then a couple of years went by and then they emailed me out of the blue and they said, hey, we've got this show coming up. Um, we know you don't have any writing credits, but are you still interested in writing? And I said, yes. So I was actually working with some other brothers. I was working with the Duplass brothers over on their show, Room 104 on HBO. Yep. And um, and ugh, they're just so nice. Mark Duplass is such like a wonderful human being. But I had to ditch them <laughs> because <laughs> the Hagman brothers um, invited me in to interview for the writer's room assistant. And then they graciously, um, you know, encouraged me to encourage my writing because they gave me an episode to write. And then, you know, all that's all she wrote, basically. To, <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's how I got in. It's it, it, it's really hard to make that jump between production into writing. Um, but I so deeply appreciate all the people I've met and all the different hats I've worn now because it just has taught me it takes a village to yep. produce anything. And the stronger your team, I mean, the better the workflow is going to be, the more you can trust everyone. And I just have such a deep love and affection for everybody that, you know, like you watch those credits on some things and it just goes on for pages and pages. And I, I have such genuine love for all of them now because I've been one of those people where it's just like, yeah, yeah you get, you're below the line and you kind of get lost in the mix, but every single pair of hands matters. And, um, it, you, you don't have a, a quality product. Honestly, it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of people to make something that maybe people don't consider a quality, <laughs> But um, either way, it takes a village, and I'm really grateful for 
all the experiences I've had so far. And this was such a phenomenal way to jump into a writer, the writing side of things with this team. So it's been a, it's been a great journey so far. So, okay. Definitely an interesting one. I think we're going to expand on that in an, on our interview series at some point. We'll definitely get you on because that's a really interesting story. So I think that warrants some further investigation as they say. Um, (laughs) So let's cast our minds back then. End of 2022, beginning of 2023, Paramount slams the hammer and says Prodigy is over. Did that happen? Well, (laughs) from Paramount's perspective, it did. did. Um, Obviously, fans' reaction was incredible. Um, We all as fans love the show. Um, How was that for you, knowing that you, you know, you're starting work on season two and all of a sudden it all grinds to a halt. Figuratively. I know it didn't actually grind to a halt, but figuratively grinds to a halt. <laughs> yeah, Jason, take. do you want to go first? Because I know you guys yeah. never stopped working. Like CBS no. was still throwing money at us. Well, well was... literally just, here, have money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, I opened a, a manila envelope and there was money. <laughs> yeah. <No. laughs> well, How do was, I get uh... some of them? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that was like that was like early summer that we learned that and it was like I remember you know the Hagmans telling us what ha- like they're pulling us off of P+ but we get to keep going. And that was mm-hmm. the only part I needed to hear is yeah. that we need we were going to keep going. I I didn't think we were going to get a season th- I wanted a season 3 because you know, you do season one, it is, you know, it's like, it's hard and you're trying to find the style. Two is like better, but there's always room for improvement. And then three, it feels like, okay, we're going to have some fun, mm-hmm. and, you know? So you always want to get to that fun part. And I feel like, I, you know, I've been a part of a lot of shows that get canceled at, you know, season one and then season two. And you're like, God, I just want to get to the season three. Um, but yeah, it was heartbreaking for the fan, like to me for the fans, you know, because it's just like you didn't feel like there was much support behind the show, even though it was like the, one of the most amazing shows technologically, the look yeah. of it, the feel of it, the stories we're telling, the character design, like everything. You're like, really, you want to, you you don't want to get behind that. So it was it was heartbreaking, but. To me, it was like if if they were to gonna kick us out and they were gonna just stop production, that's that's when I it would have been like a, a real gut punch. But yeah, the fact that we got to keep going and <clears throat> and I knew the support of the Hag like from the Hagmans on down, like nothing but support. So yeah, Aaron. Yeah, I I agree. I think that the fact that Paramount was like, well, we're we're pulling it and we're canceling it in a form, but there was still funding to finish season two. Definitely, you know, maybe it's my stubborn optimism because I'm just like, don't worry, we'll figure it out. Um, I just from the very get go when I heard that, I just had that like, you know sneaky feeling that this was going to work out somehow and that for whatever reason it wasn't the right fit for paramount but i wasn't in those rooms so maybe paramount actually wanted to take it out and they felt that prodigy was a good one to take out i don't know we don't know we don't need to know the important thing like jason said was they wanted to keep going and finish season two so that was huge because similar to how jason felt i was just just so frustrated at the thought that all of this really great work that had gone into season two with the stories and like yep. where we were, where we knew we were going to be ending season two and just, just everything, everything, all, all the amazing worlds that we're going to go to and the different aliens. It's just like, but people have been responding so well to this and they're going to be blown away by season two. And so it was definitely a frustration at first, but from the from the beginning, I had that gut feeling that mm, I think this is going to work out for the better. But I had no idea Netflix was going to be the home, you know, our second home. And I was so 
so blown away by the response from the fans, literally renting a plane to <laughs> fly. To, I mean, I've just never seen, I've never been a part oh, of yeah, a project cool. that has that kind of stuff. Um, that, well, that you know what they say, cool. go big or go home. So yeah. exactly. <laughs> How with, with them, with them canceling in it, canceling, in, <laughs> with them canceling it so suddenly yet continuing to fund the development of season two. Mm -hmm. Did you, I, I know, Erin, you, you said you had this sneaking suspicion. Was there sort of this underlying confidence that, okay, they want to fund this because they clearly know that, although it's not a, a fit for Paramount, that there will be a market for this somewhere else. Was there like this underlying confidence within the team to go, yeah, okay, it's, it's a bit gut-wrenching that they've, they've not only cancelled it, but pulled season one from Paramount Plus immediately. So no one can even experience season one and so it, it can't earn new fans that way. But was there that underlying confidence to go, yeah, like we, there, there will be a home for this no matter what. And like, was it down to the, the tenacity of the fans? Were you aware of the tenacity of the fans? Because in the last, I would say six, seven years when Star Trek fans have wanted something bar Star Trek Legacy, we sort of got it because we got Anson Mountain Discovery and everyone was like, he needs okay, his own show. You are having your own show, whether Paramount likes it or not. And they got it. And to see that replicated with, um, I mean, we saw it replicated with the petition for Legacy after Picard. And then the, ten the very same tenacity with Prodigy, like in the space of two years, Star Trek fans have just rallied so ferociously around these shows. And like Erin said, rented a plane to fly over Netflix. It's sort of... Well, what now did I know you, you can do that for a thousand bucks. And put yeah. In, put yeah. It. So that, <laughs> that's good to know. What messaging <laughs> could you put at the end of a plane? Put, <laughs> I know. Employ me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, to me, th my confidence came from the Higmans. They, when they got out of their meeting, you know, when they had all their talks with, with, with everybody, they were the ones that brought in the confidence and it gave me, it personally gave me confidence. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the project was already funded. Basically, it just would have been like, you know, no, no further, mm. you know, no further money is being, whatever it is. So like, it was like, why would you stop it? You know, like yeah. we already had everything in place. We had, you know, Technicolor slash Micros was already, you know, we were already going on the animation and everything. And then like, we were just, you know, so it's, and it would have, it would have destroyed their chances of either selling the show or, I mean, I'm glad they didn't write it off because then yeah. nobody would have saw it, but it would have really, it wouldn't have been a package to sell, yeah. you know, yeah. if they were just like, cool, I got a season and a half. Yeah, and, and there's and no conclusion because it yeah. feels like it went perfectly like full circle. Yep. And then to me, if there was a season three, or I would love to do like a ninety minute movie or something like just show another adventure of this crew going out on the new prodigy or I'm sorry on the new um, protostar, um, mm -hmm. you know, and whatever the battle clean. Yeah. Yeah. Netflix. We want a ninety-minute movie. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Like, let's get a plane. We need a I know. Ninety-minute <laughs> minute prodigy movie. But Aaron, yeah, you can speak to that. Um, but yeah, to me, it was. Yeah, it was I I agree. At every at every crew screening, because we would still get together as a crew um, to go watch. At Nickelodeon has this really beautiful theater, and so we would all pile in there to watch episodes as they were done. And at every and Aaron, one, Aaron and I would would talk over donuts and yes, uh, yeah. After okay. donuts. Snap question: What's your favorite donut? <gasps> Chocolate. Man, this this is a serious question. <laughs> yeah. For me, anything from Krispy Kremes. <laughs> oh, I like the chocolate old fashions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I have a favorite donut shop here in LA. It's called Donut Friend. Um, I am not sponsored, but if they want to send me some free donuts, <laughs> I'm game. Um, but man, their apple fritters are to die for. But mm. I'm a sucker for like the Boston cream kind of donut. Like anything that you put a custardy cream inside of, yep. I'm just like, I'm I'm there. Yeah. Anyway. So yes, yep. the donuts were great. The food was great, Jason. They always spoiled us with some kind of treat. Uh, yeah. um, but at every cruise screening, the Hagmans are 
you know, just bless them because they would get up in front of us and they would give us an update. And they were very honest, you know, when there wasn't a clear trajectory, they would just tell us, but they, they were, they believed in the project and they believed in the crew and they believed, you know, our, the real life crew (laughs) and they believed in the quality that everyone was producing. And so, you know, it's, it's hard not to be hopeful over something when you look and you can just see so many wonderful, talented people have come together to make something that looks so good, sounds so good, delivers, you know, a great story. And, um, but there's always that part of me that, I mean, I've seen so many talented things, so many talented people not be able to walk through to completion with a project and so many great ideas being shelved, you know, or, you know, whatever. So there's always, you can just never predict what's going to happen in Hollywood, but there was definitely confidence from the Hagemans. I agree with Jason and also confidence of just, this is undeniably great. How could they not want to make money off of this? Yeah. (laughs) I think as well, it was, I think Kate Mulgrew summed it up perfectly well when they first announced Prodigy that we've had Star Trek for adults for so long. Mm -hmm. And we as adults are not getting any younger, so we need to inspire that next generation of Star Trek fan. And I feel like that, for whatever reason, some people took that too seriously and just wrote Prodigy off as a kid's show. I know yeah. so many adults that watch Prodigy. <laughs> yeah. And, and to be fair, it's the one Star Trek, it's the Star Trek show that got my fiance into Star Trek. Oh, that's what, so great. I have a question for you two. So what about when you first saw artwork from it or saw any images from it like what what was your immediate reaction oh my god murph is amazing i want murph (laughs) (laughs) but yeah i mean like we're able to like see a brick car and we're able to see telluride we're able to see like all these other things like did you were you guys like immediately like yes let's 100 percent it was yeah it was for me it was is that a medusan um it and it was yeah and it was for, for me just seeing the the quality yeah. of the animation and you, you think that this is a kid show on paramount plus or netflix wherever it, you know wherever it aired around the world and you 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 look at that and even the opening credits you're just like wow like this is this would have been movie quality like yeah. a few years ago and this is just like nope this is standard now and it's just and i mean i i am a i am a ship fan so just seeing voyager uh the voyager a the dauntless the the whole fleet and i'm just oh. the, the big the, thing that was, the higman's always yeah. talked about is wish fulfillment right it was yeah like, yeah in yeah. everybody's wish for not just the kit like yeah. it's like our fans wish the fans everybody's wish fulfillment yeah um which was super inspiring um yeah and for me when i first started on it like i was like well i don't want this to be star trek in name only where no. you know it feels like a cg show or it feels like okay you know the the framing and the camera you know it's like who cares i was like no i i, I watched i went back and watched original series next generation voyager uh jj's movies and i was just like picking apart what vi- what are the visual things that you need to make this thing star trek mm-hmm. and it can be as simple as starting on the feet and coming up you know when they come in through the doors it yep. could be walk and talks how they're filmed it could be uh you know obviously like the the language of ships going by and the language of you know like when you see like a a shot that just sets you up for okay we're going from here back into the ship or Mm -hmm. you know all of those things to me make up star trek so um it was really important for me uh to to make sure that we're keeping that integrity i loved by the way jason and season two the multiple beauty shots that we would get of the little protostar and the big you know voyager side by side i'm like that's such a oh, that's such beauty. Those are fun to do because then I, you know, I get to like set up the ships, put them there, and I just rotate around and I'm like, wow, well, 
the best way. Oh, let's get so, to the nasal. Let's that's go pretty. Oh, that's now. pretty. Let's go this way and look at, you know. So you just yeah. kind of see what lens is and which, you know, what is the best way to present these guys. So yeah. how many hours did you just sit there going and just moving your mouse going, I like that, I like that, I like that. Well, I, like I would, that. would do that. Between <laughs> meetings. I'd have a meeting. I would have Zoom over here and I'm just in the back like this. It's like <laughs> animating the spaceship in the meeting. Sometimes it'd be like 45 minutes of just like, all right, let me get a carry on. I'd be like, that can go on air. Boom. All right. <laughs> you know, if I had to do like, you know, uh, was it like the um, the Rev One chasing the protostar yep. in the first season? You know that would take a little bit more. I would you know render out a shot, put it into Premiere, get a timeline, make making sure that the sequence all feels like a sequence, and then I would go in and kind of do some other fine details, camera shake and stuff like that. But I also was trying to think about what uh, when they're in the live action, when they were on a sound stage and they were filming these ships, you know, and and doing camera tricks, I would use I would try to use the same camera tricks, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. just. Yeah, as much as possible. So, yeah, yeah, fun, fun, fun. So, Very fun. I think season two. Well, I think I can categorically say season two has been received incredibly well by critics, by fans, by everybody. There was a review I came across on Written Tomatoes the other day on Written Tomatoes, Rotten Tomatoes, even. Rotten? And um, it, do you know what? It's one of those things that I just thought actually that's a very apt review and it goes it says star trek prodigy is the first show in years to actually feel like trek it's more than just a children's oh. show it encapsulates gene rogers vision in a way that he would be proud and carries the torch to the next generation and i, I saw that. that and i thought um it's by <laughs> daniel d on rotten tomatoes and i and i saw that and i thought yeah I, Dan, I wholeheartedly Dan agree the last that. letter of his <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's getting dead. how does it make you feel knowing that it's been so well received by everybody? You know, I that review kind of reminds me of, Michael, what you were just saying also reminded me of the Star Trek it, of it all. Like when you saw it first, you were just like, oh, is that a Medusin? And it just reminds me, I know it's animation and some people might have a knee-jerk reaction to that. However... Star Trek is otherworldly and there are so many yep. aliens like in the writing process we were lucky enough to be having open dialogues with other writers and showrunners on the other Star Trek shows cuz we were all trying to work you know in harmony basically and they have their own challenges in live action and being somebody who comes from below the line on live action it gets really expensive to try to make believable, you know, not just looks of aliens, but other worlds and everything. And yeah. so not saying that Star Trek Prodigy is cheap because it's not. <laughs> and we were constantly being pushed to like write as epic as possible, but also try to be realistic of how can we make this more budget friendly. Yeah. Um, but we can we can push the envelope and do things in animation with with a seamlessness and that it's just more challenging in live action. So we have rock talk all the time. And that would be a probably pretty expensive to do if you were doing it in live action. So yeah. I just think that animation, I completely understand people have a knee-jerk reaction to it because animation has a different history than live action. But where animation is today and what you can do with it today is so epic and it's so um you can just you can bend those boundaries even more in some ways and for star yeah. trek it's the perfect kind of world to dive into animation now i'm so glad that daniel on rotten tomatoes also feels like we captured the spirit of star trek but i think that the visual ability in animation even just get, it's it's a powerful tool in an in a different world like star trek so it That's my really, thought. It really opens up the possibilities because, as we as we know with Prodigy, it's set. What where are we saying? Five years after the event of Voyager, I believe. I think it is something like five, six years. Oh, yeah, something like, so, I can't remember. But 
the way that Star Trek has been in the last seven years, where we've gone from Star Trek Prodigy in the 2380s, Lower Decks again, 2380s early, then Picard, 2399, 2401. You can't do what Prodigy has done in live action no. because with all due respect, people have aged. They are not, you know, Voyager was, the end of Voyager was over 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and this opens up those possibilities to go, we can have Kate Mulgrew as Janeway being back from the Delta Quadrant only a few years. And it opens yeah. up those possibilities to explore yeah. those, I, would, I wouldn't say forgotten parts, but those those avenues of the timeline that we, we've we never explored. Like there's a lot of talk about the lost era uh, yeah. between Star Trek VI and the next generation. There was nothing stopping an animation going in and doing that and <laughs> with with prodigy it's sort of like we are we are in that gap and as we see with season two it bookends where sort of voyager ended to mm -hmm. where picard more or less begins and it it it's just because it's brilliant because it, it's just linking everyone in the universe together and what i the one thing i love about star trek is you can have a cameo from another Star Trek show yeah. and no one in the show cares with the greatest of respect because they all exist in that world they they yeah. are all there in that world and you see in season two where they're just like well Admiral Picard is is not happy about this and it's everything is just so casually talking about it and yeah. it's wonderful because it just feels like a shared world that is living and breathing and what Prodigy did so well even with being animation, it makes it feel real. It makes it feel this is just another live action show. And it, it, it's visually stunning, but you, you have more freedom with the aliens yeah. than you would yeah. in a live action show. I mean, we wouldn't and, have Murph. And to have yeah. Spock there. Yeah. And to have, yeah. you yep. know, Odo. And to have every, yes. you know, in the first season, you it's know, like spotting. that was like to, like to me, like, being able to animate Spock, you know, mm -hmm. I animated a couple Spock shots. It, it's like having celebrities on your screen. Yeah. You yeah. know, and animate, you know, in, in yeah. 3D yeah. puppet form, you know, so, and even the ships are celebrities. Everything, yeah. everything is, you know, a triple is a celebrity. It's like, it's, it's so cool. But that's all really great points. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and heck, everybody ages so well in Prodigy. Like, can we just give a shout out <laughs> to Janeway and Chakotay? They are ripped yeah. when you see them. So they are aging well in Prodigy. Full it's beard, a Chakotay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> she was in tank top shape. She was still in tank top shape. <laughs> I have to say, it's, it's a little bit, I don't know, I feel it was a bit bizarre, but in a good way to see both real Janeway, as it were, and hologram Janeway. Because so, you can see how they've aged as well, yeah. which I thought was, it's just, again, something that you can do in animation that you just can't do yeah. in physical form. Um, so, Erin, what was yeah. your favourite moment in season two? Now, this could be something that you've written. Uh -oh. It could be um, a specific character development. It could be anything. Well, I already know the answer to that, and I am totally biased, and I am totally <laughs> going to call out something in one of my own episodes. So you can Which shame you can me do. for that all you want. But um, I was so pumped to get to write the episode that had the mirror universe in it. Yeah. Um, cracked mirror. Again, I'm just, I'm going to own, I'm going to become self-aware of my bias here. And <laughs> it's probably my favorite episode in season two. I mean, but there's other parts of the show that I just am in love with. But the mirror universe was so fun to dive into. And being able to write mirror Chakotay and mirror Janeway having their spicy little chemistry <laughs> was super fun and having the evil whale and um <laughs> yeah like just that whole world was so fun and honestly you guys understandably it had to be cut because it didn't fit with what the other shows were doing I had a whole Borg sequence written like ready to go I had oh. all this other stuff written but it had to be cut and I completely understand and support that decision it was heartbreaking but 
um, it, that the mirror universe was just like such a highlight for me. And, um, and as like, I don't know if this was just the universe blessing me because it knew that I loved the mirror universe so much, but actually I got to attend one of the recordings of Kate Mulgrew and watch her record lines as mirror Janeway. And that was like a surreal moment for me because I grew up like my parents introduced me to TNG and Voyager when I was younger. And so like, I grew up knowing, you know, oh, Captain Janeway. And just to see, I'm like sitting on Zoom watching Kate Mulgrew record lines that I wrote was just crazy. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm openly biased, but like that was definitely probably my highlight moment for the season. My, my favorite line from that is Jenkum just going, oh, come on, even the whales are evil. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> We had to get Jillian in there just being like, you know, <laughs> hail the Terran Empire. <laughs> I have to say, who named the whale Jillian? You know, it's that... just such a great name for a whale, and I don't know why. I know. <laughs> I think that was, was that I canon could be wrong, Jillian... but I'm sorry, go ahead. I just said, was that canon or was it a name that we picked? No, it was, no. It was called Jillian. Oh, yeah, I, I could be wrong. wrong, but I think I remember that being one of those Aaron Walkey moments and trying to give a nod of respect to um, Jillian. Is it that was her full name? Jillian Roddenberry? Anyway, it was just yeah. like that was just the name that Aaron Walkey came up with. And we all were just like, yeah, that's a thumbs up. I don't even remember it being like a discussion or trying to brainstorm for it different names. It was just it's, Jillian. It's <laughs> such a, a wonderful, tiny little nod to the voyage yep. home. The one yes. with the whales. It's, yeah. It's so beautiful. Like you don't even have to, the don't even have to emphasize of it. Fans just go, I get it. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, what, I wanted dolphins as well, but yes, we like we we stuck with the whale. Uh, Jason, what was your favorite moment from the season? Um, well, I think I mean again, it's like the the personal, like what I got to animate and what I got to put on screen. I definitely just the um, the first looks at, at Voyager. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for yeah. me, it's like, I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to point to, uh, the first movie. And I mean, that sequence when you're first seeing the enterprise is like, it's like 10 minutes long. Yeah. It's, it's a long sequence, but those shots are so cool. Um, so I wanted to pay homage to that as much as possible. And, put put the camera and put the audience in with them like inside the cage you know or yeah. inside the uh port or whatever i'm pardon me for not space dock space dock <laughs> space dock yeah i wanted to put the camera in there i wanted to like just watch you know the the um the shuttle kind of just gingerly like coming around and trying to get beauty shots of that so to be able to do that, like tip to tail of like all those shots was really cool for me. Um, selfishly, <laughs> but uh, no, rightfully also, so, they're beautiful. Yes, they are beautiful. But also, like you know, there was also obviously a lot of cool story moments. But like technologically, we did some stuff. And shout out to you know my. Well, I was his right hand man, and we've been each other's right hand men, Patrick Krebs, um, on a lot of this stuff. Because without his technical expertise and his knowledge, and then me going, "Yeah, let's let's do it, let's try it," like we wouldn't have floated the Protostar on a sea of gas, you know. <laughs> um, so, which that, is stunning, by the way. Those graphics for that entire scene—that's all Pat. Beautiful. That's all Pat. He you know, came up with, with ways to do that between like uh red Maya, Redshift, and Houdini to come up with these volumes, you know, based on geometry. So in animation we could see the vol, you know, we put the we put the protostar on top of it. We could see kind of the volume. And then when we rendered it, boom, you got all these yep. like beautiful gas clouds. And then uh, and then obviously like the gas, the vortex that we did was super awesome. I animated a lot of those 
ship, you know, some of those ships coming coming around and like the ones where it's kind of floating and, and going into the in, into the vortex. Um, but yeah, that was super cool. And I don't think a lot of people a lot of people would shy away from it or, you know, tell the writers like we can't see it or we we got to work around it, whatever. But I love heading like like them i love heading straight forward into those things that are are difficult and yep. um seemingly impossible and then you pull them off and you're like oh, like we would sit in the theater pat and i would we just be like dude look <laughs> 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 like yeah that was working pretty good you know <laughs> um you can't always get your man you know but it's it the i i'm really proud of of all of those moments that that we got to pull off that a lot a lot of people would get scared of and run away or you know try to work around but so yeah. sort of a technique technical geek animation answer but you know no it, jason it's, it's a, yeah that is it's stuff like that those moments that you guys helped bring to life and create yeah. that kind of what you were saying earlier that I agree with, it really does feel like you're watching a movie the whole season. It just, yep. it's so, I mean, we would joke about in the writer's room, like throwing around the world, cinematic, cinematic, cinematic. <laughs> but but it is, it it really is. So it's, but that's such go, a beautiful well, what moment. Mean, what does that mean, right? And it, well, it's like a designer, isn't it? When they say, oh, make it pop. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Yeah, <laughs> Define yeah then yeah. you got to go figure that out, you know. Yeah. And, I, I, um, but I, like with you know with a leader like the Higmans, and then you know and and Ben um, Ben Hibben, like you know he, he was one of those guys that I loved working with. I love picking his brain. I love you know I love getting my ass kicked by him of like when I would show him a sequence and he's like ah you know he would give me like camera stuff and and you know it. it it didn't knock me back. It made me want to go. Yeah. It, it made me want to do it even better. And, you know, we, we got to a place in season two where, you know, like I, I didn't even have to show them stuff sometimes, but I, I would have to send it to somebody, either Ben or Patrick and be like, can you just, can you just watch <laughs> this before I just go, this is going on air, you know, like, cause we were all by ourselves, like at our homes, like yeah, doing the show. And, um, you know, we, we got to go in a little bit, uh, toward in season two, but I was mostly just at home, you know. Doing yeah, that stuff, was weird. So, yeah. So, Goodwill, what was your favorite moment from season two? Well, firstly, I have to say to Jason, the proto star on the gas clouds, the first thing I thought of immediately was the intro to Voyager as Voyager is mm -hmm. flying through exactly the, yeah. the gas nebula. And I, I immediately drew those parallels because it is when you watched the intro of voyager for the first time and there were so many spectacular shots and that the one shot that always sits in my mind rent free is is voyager just cutting a wave mm -hmm. all the way yep. through that gas and when we see the process and that was back in 1998 or whatever yeah. that was that they did or yep. maybe even earlier 96 whatever when yeah. when you're using yeah. light wave and you know the technology wasn't as that you know i don't even know how they did that Honestly. And it's, but yeah, I drew the parallels as soon as I saw that shot because I was like, I, I, I can sense that this is what someone has gone for. Someone has seen that intro and gone, I want to do this with the protostar in this scene, and um, do the spinal tap and turn it up to eleven. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, oh, it goes <laughs> all the way up to eleven. Um, <laughs> my, my favorite part of season two. There, there are many, but for me. And I messaged, I messaged Mike number one when this happened because I was like, "Oh my god, Wesley Crusher!" Yep, yeah, appearing because I, I, I'd watched all the way up to this, and then I saw that, and I was like, and it was one of those where, you know, what it leads up like you were on about Jason, where Star Trek always has those shots that just lead up, so they have like a, a, a foot pan up to the thing when they go on the bridge or something like that and yep. the other thing that star trek does it eludes just before it reveals and when they enter the temple and i saw the travel i was just like <laughs> and then you, you open the door and i'm like <laughs> and I, was, and I immediately and I, was I was like somebody else it's crusher it's crusher <laughs> um and I, I lost my mind because it was like 
oh, this is where they are going with it. He's mm-hmm. going to be involved. And just having him, it was the crusher we know, but it was a different crusher. It was a crusher with confidence. Because we saw him yeah. in season two of Picard briefly. But this was like the unhinged Doctor Who crusher where you know there was this grandiose plan for the prodigy group but he couldn't tell them but he was always thinking and he was always doodling and he was just the reveal of crusher and then the way they sort of and again bookended it with they gave him sort like they gave the crusher character closure in a way but they then also bookended it with picard especially when he meets you know when he goes to see his mother and it's like oh what are you meeting his mother um how does it go there was a lot of feelings in the show. There, there was, was, of, there was, there was so a lot of group much. hugs, and there was a lot of feelings, and there were yeah. And, yeah it's like, I would have loved to have seen the recording <laughs> session between yeah. um, Gates and uh, Will Wheaton. It's a reunion that we needed. We've had so many yeah. reunions, and that, that's the one that was missing. Yeah. Um, and it was it was wonderful because it was just no my only take back was no one said shut up will because we needed that i think just one more time we needed a shut up will where was but, Walkie on that one yeah. oh, i'll text him later and go oh, wait where was shut up wesley just, hey. just for janeway just for janeway to do it just like yes shut up um, shut up yeah. wesley uh but it was that that was my favorite moment because we we I think a lot of feedback from especially Picard where we we didn't it was a reunion of all the TNG crew except Will Wheaton and yeah. then we had Will Wheaton back but we had him for more than 30 seconds we had him for half of season two more or less yeah. and it was just it was wonderful but it also give me that Trek hankering for a traveler <laughs> spin-off yeah. and be done I- guys Funny story. Well, so I, you know, I live in Burbank, and Will Wheaton lives in Burbank. Yeah. And um, there's a big, there's a, there's a year-round Halloween store called Halloween Town here. And so, like, late last year was probably like, you know, clearly before we were done with the show. I ran into Will Wheaton at Halloween Town. And I and I stalked him. <laughs> and I, him and his wife were walking to Halloween town, and I was like, "Oh my fucking god, it's you know." And then I and I went up, to, I went up to him. I was all, "Excuse me," I was like, "I was like, I'm working on Prodigy," you know. Yeah. And, and he's like, "Oh, you know." And like we kind of had a little dial, you know, just like, "Yeah, man, it's so good," to, you know. Like his character was, you know, like no one knew that that no. that we were going to see him. And another fan walked up and joined our conversation and was like, Will Wheaton, whatever. And he's like, what are you guys talking about? And we're just all nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and like, we literally, we like shut this guy out. Cause we were like, <laughs> and he's like, I'm in the business. I work on this. And we were like, uh, uh, sorry, dude. No. No, I've, I visit Not Burbank today. a lot. What, what is the name of this store? Just the next time I'm up there. Just no, Halloween, town. Halloween <laughs> town, baby. Halloween. Get all your Halloween gear there. I've I've driven I, past that store many a times. It's oh, a it's a. Go I'm going to park up in that store a lot of times now. <laughs> there. Every yeah. time you're in LA, you're going to be there. Where's Will? <laughs> yeah. So, it's Jason. Jason! <laughs> yeah, it's going to be me. He's going to be running away, going shit. Who are you? That's that strange I'm Mike from Wilton, Wilton. Yeah, there's, there's a crazy Brit after me. <laughs> so, um, what were some of the challenges that you faced in this season? Uh, that's an open question to either one of you. I mean, you were none. The, there were the no challenges. Huh? None at all. Okay. Wow. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jason, take it away. <laughs> oh, I mean, so many challenges. So many challenges, but. We, I will, I, I want to shout out to CJ Sarasheen and JD, uh, Jean-Denis Haas, my two animation directors. I mean, between the three of us, we animated a lot for just the three of us. And then we have the whole team, you know, in Mikros and shout out to Michael Ernest and and all the leads and animators over in India, Patrick and I would go over to India. Uh, we went over a couple times. We couldn't go early in the pandemic because yeah. of pandemic reasons. But we went over at least tw- we went over twice. And those guys were working their butts off on this show. 
and not a lot of them. I mean, some of them have seen Star Trek, not a lot of them. So they were kind of trying to, you know, get the feel of it, you know, but um, the hard thing to pull off is you storyboard it yep. and then you get it into animation and those things can't always be one-to-one, right? Especially in action and especially in the Star Trek world, right? So uh, a lot of the hand-to-hand combat, you know, it's one thing to storyboard it and to, you know, sit there and look at the storyboards and reference it. That's not what it's about. It's about interpreting it, right? So the fights between Gwen and Asensia, um, CJ animated m- m- most to all of that. So she she would go through and, you know, redo the kicks and the punches and the falls and the struggles and all that stuff. Like she was such a super fast and great animator and really saved our butts on that stuff. And so we would have these like opportunities to go into the animation. I would put like I had a mirror hard drive of all of our assets at Nickelodeon and Technicolor. So I <laughs> would pull down everything, load it up in Maya, redo some cameras, make it more exciting, you know, or we would, you know, reduce, you know, accentuate some face or, some, you know, some ex- expressions, stuff like that, as much as we could to just elevate the, mm-hmm. the show. Um, so that was a big one. Um, just even I, I had to up, I had to pour thousands of dollars into my machine to get mm-hmm. it to so where I was faster than fast to be able to you know handle all the big sets, handle mm-hmm. the ziggurat, handle you know whatever. So if there was more interesting shots that you know that you could get out of the sets, I would go in work with Ben, work with Pat. And I would just go in and like, okay, how about this shot? How about this shot? How about, you know? Um, So there was a lot of that, a lot of technical uh, hurdles, clearly like aging zero and Mm -hmm. aging Tysis. Um, You know, we did these series of blend shapes and, um, you know, uh, color morphs, which is a terrible term but <laughs> you know just 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 to get like to get them to look like we can Older watch than they are. them yeah. age on screen was was a big one yeah. um handling you know the mirror universe one or when they when they uh uh Aaron, it's all your hologram, fault now <laughs> the, the hologram clones the hologram clones we got 16 characters on the screen it's Ooh. all of them all, you know, mirrored and they're all interacting. So, like, that was tough. So, I don't know. Goatees. Goatee, yeah, goatee, yeah, yeah, goatee, goatee technology. Goatee um, <laughs> Yeah, it was just just all of it, you know. And, and all the while keeping in mind, like, the fans in the back of your head, the rabid fans, the, like, am I impressing Rod Roddenberry and Rod the Roddenberry, you know, like... <laughs> And, and, but also like you know going to events and talking to him and see and and feeling how impressed they were you were like okay we're yeah we're in the right spot because they kind of left us alone you yeah. know they, we, we wouldn't get like a big list of like retakes it just was like all right well this is looking good and we were like okay yeah <laughs> so it's really yeah. kind of up to us of, of our own um you know whatever our own style our own um, well, you guys earned that trust, Jason. I, like yeah, you I was and the whole say, team yeah. earned that trust. Yeah. And I, Jason, finish your thought before I jump no, in. No, no, that's it. I, I should okay. stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, the answer is all of it, but it, yeah. it it was all like we loved every step of the way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my answer to what the biggest challenge is from my point of view, kind of mirrors what you are hinting at as well kind of the Pun whole intended. thing <laughs> she has a goatee on now <laughs> <laughs> no we're, um, we're all mirrors she's the she's prime universe <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah i could put i gotta put a gray thing in my hair and a little little yes. patch on my eye <laughs> but um but yeah from the writing point of view i would say in a similar way, kind of all of it in a sense of really the the shortest way I can put it is page count. Like, mm. um, 
I I know the rule of thumb, and this is actually an issue I've been talking about lately with people right now. The rule of thumb is one page for one minute. True. And that's a that's according to the uh, the software that you use to write scripts. It's called Final Draft. Yeah. And so it's structured in a certain way that one page is supposed to roughly equal one minute of running time. Every single project that I have worked on, live action and animation, that never is true. It's always longer. It The running time always goes longer than the page count. Now, I'm not trying to start a war with executives or anything like that. It's just that <laughs> there, it's a ballpark figure. And in every live action and animation thing that I've been involved in, in my opinion and in my experience, it's always like, oh, we got to find time. We got to cut. We got to find time. So the page count really in actuality, in my opinion, is really just kind of the minimum running time that you're going to yeah. have. But then you have to consider the genre that you are writing. And when you're talking about maybe like a character-driven drama that is like set in modern day with very simple locations, maybe you're talking about closer to the page count time. But if you're talking about an epic world or science fiction or an action adventure, that running time is probably going to be longer than your page count. Well, just and so these are shots, establishing gonna, shots, yeah. you know, alone, you're like, you're burning up three to five seconds or if not yeah. longer. Exactly. Seconds. It's all of that time, isn't it? Where there is no speech. Yeah. yeah. Right. And you you know, that that's always breath. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Like on, and again, most writers know this, but it's funny how this can kind of get lost sometimes when people are like, well, this should be the page count. It's like, well, you got to you gotta look at the whole beast here. And because the action line, we're, we're always trying to capture the most epic thing you can with the least amount of words. And yeah. so the action might just take like a line, maybe two on the page, but you're talking about a sequence you're talking about like action and visuals and establishing yeah. and even like character looks that you want to see. So again, it's so funny. This has been a topic that I've been talking about a lot lately. And that is the page count is literally, in my opinion, the minimum, the bare minimum running time in yeah. actuality. Yeah. And with a epic world like Star Trek and with these really great like ensemble of characters and then you've got these amazing like you know Crusher and everybody coming in you want to give as much time and we said repeatedly both in season one and season two there was always the conversation like we're trying to cram an hour-long episode in a half an hour show like this is this is so epic there's so much we could do with it and I like again, like I said, just with the mirror universe alone, I had to cut a whole entire Borg sequence. And there's just so much that got cut, even that does go through to Jason and his team. Even from there in the final edit, they still have to cut things out because it's yep. just trying to get the time. So that it's a good problem to have too much of a good thing, I guess you could say. Um, well, and it was difficult because. We, it, uh, initially we were on Nickelodeon Paramount plus, which has more strict running times. If yep. it was Netflix out of the gate, who cares? You probably you could know? have had yeah. a 40 minute but episode. Then, it's more, and... then it becomes more about the bid, the animation bid for the animation studio. Right. So if you're like, yep. Hey, we bid for 23 minutes and this is 25 minutes. Yeah. Where's that overage? You know, that kind of shit yep. stuff. But yeah, exactly. So i tell you what, let's stay on that theme of things that were removed. Obviously, Erin, we've got your, I'm going to presume, incredible Borg sequence that was Force. was cut. Um, what it else? What I've, it was a Borg dance. So, uh, yes. <laughs> it was a musical. <laughs> so, um, Jason, you've got the uh, the final version of that that you can share with us, right? <laughs> I animated, yes, we animated it. And then we awesome. It. <laughs> um, so what, what else are you disappointed that got cut? from the show that you really really wanted to see in i don't know if i can answer that aaron do you know i mean there's always there's the always little season. odds and ends like little lines that have to get cut what do you say i didn't hear it i said the third season <laughs> <laughs> 
there's going to be a third movie. season. <laughs> yes. Um, but we're all wishing it. Yeah, I think it's going to happen. But yeah. We'll we'll just hold it out there. But yeah. um, but yeah, there's always like when you're when you're watching it back and everything. Um, it's it's you you definitely don't want to watch anything that you worked on and be too precious about anything. So yeah. it's understandable that things get cut. Um, but yeah, like even my brain is going back to even episode 119. Again, that was a very big epic episode with a lot of battles and you want to give that time to all of the beautiful ships and, you know, everything. Um, but looking back, I was just like, oh, they had to cut that line. Oh, they had to cut that line. You know, like things like that where you just you have to be ruthless sometimes in the editing room and yep. you have to be like, okay, even if you're emotionally attached to it and not that I was the editor, but I completely understand this having worked with editors, like you have to be like, yes, we're emotionally attached to maybe this line or this scene, but what, what can we lose that the audience can still gain the story from? Yeah, And, you know, in a perfect world, you have more time so you can give the audience all of it, but it's just little, it's just little things little moments and lines and stuff like that kind of sprinkled throughout. Well, that is the balancing act, isn't it? You, you've got to say, what can I strip out where it's not going to affect that story, but still keeps us on budget and still keeps us within time and so on and so forth. And keeps the, the pace of the yeah. story going. Yeah. yeah. The last thing you want is for that flow to get broken because you kind of lost yeah. your momentum then, haven't you? Yeah. Um, was there anything uh, from your side, Jason, that you had animated that you really, really th need thought needed to be in there that got cut? Oh. I don't no. think so. God, I don't know. I mean, I, I, nothing stands out that I was like, oh, um, because because <clears throat> we had to um, once these episodes got locked, we knew exactly what we had to do. Yeah, you know, and we had very little time to do it. I had about two weeks per episode that slotted out for me to do whatever I needed to do. Yep. Or the reanimation. So I, and stuff. I still have all my, I, I, I always kept a list of like all my, sh all my shots and what I needed to do and what got cut and what's in and what's out because I had to stay organized. Um, but typically if there was like, you know, I loved when shit got cut because, you know, if I was like, Oh my God, I don't have to animate that anymore. I can focus on this or like, Oh, the, this, or this sequence got shortened or I'd yep. go in, you know, and then, so, um, yeah, it, it, it wasn't, I guess from, from a different perspective, a non-writing perspective, I, it, it was more like Ben and the Higmans were the ultimate like storytellers in that, yep. in that way. And then Patrick and I would go in and kind of just make sure we were like that nothing was, um not, not embarrassing on screen you know but things weren't complete yes you know even, even yeah. if we had you know on like 119 where we had all these explosions and like all the ships attacking each other you know we still had to cut some corners but hopefully as an audience you don't see the cuts unless you're yeah. like really in the know of like oh we had you know we couldn't do that many explosions or we couldn't do that much damage that we wanted to do because like damage is costly and damage yeah. isn't free, you know, stuff like that, but you can cover it with a shit ton of explosions, um, you know, <laughs> so, you know, or camera shake or <laughs> lens flares, you know. So, so like ship animation 101 with Jason Meyer. If you can't do damage, stick an explosion in its place. Gotcha. Camera shake, baby. Um, it's your, <laughs> I, I love yes, the mantra. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. I love the mantra that damage isn't free. I love that. I want that on a bumper sticker, but also I'm going to put on a T-shirt. I think damage yeah. is not free, and I damage say isn't free. Every time, <laughs> uh, every project I've ever been on, every you know, you get to the end of the script, and they're all, and the whole village explodes, and you're like, oh god, <laughs> ow. Um, yes, it's going to take me eight weeks to just animate the dead right, part of like, the village. Oh come on, you can't just you can't just blow it up. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I guess from that from that perspective, I, I kind of stayed a little bit more like neutral of from, yeah. from that. But um, you know, I just I just loved being part of the process. This was the biggest show I've ever worked on. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and this was really, you know, me like doing push-ups and going to the gym for any other project I've ever, and including the current one that I'm on that I can't say what it Talk is, about. but yep. it's going to be big and super crazy and fun. Um, but Prodigy yeah, season three, yeah? I wish. <laughs> I would announce it. Uh, but that Star Trek Prodigy, even, you know, even just the storytelling and, and all that stuff has really prepared me for, for everything else that I'm doing. So I'm super grateful for for the whole the whole process for sure so as you're both trekkies what is your favorite easter egg for season two <laughs> i literally put an easter egg in a scene <laughs> no. uh, did you really did you actually put no, a... <laughs> no I don't, I don't... aaron go ahead you you that's i I, th- I have not thought about that. So I'm like, oh gosh, I don't have a quick answer off the top. Well, actually, okay, Mike and Michael, like, can you help? What are some of your favorite ones? Because yeah, that we're... might help inspire me. Ooh. Yes, we're putting it on you. The tables have been turned. Uh... Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Spotlight. Okay, masses, okay, masses with questions. I am not prepared for this. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think mine was there was a there was a briefing with uh, the senior crew on the Voyager A, mm. and they are on about the the Prodigy crew. They are the most dysfunctional crew I have ever encountered since the USS Cerritos. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. such a lovely callback to it's just like yes, everyone else recognizes it is the horniest ship in Starfleet. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I've heard I've heard people talk about that one, but yeah, what about you, Mike? I think it's probably going to be the Lurian. Because that's a nice nod back to DS9. Mm -hmm. Or, and I can't remember the name for it for love nor money, but Rock Talk's new pet. Ribble. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Master Replicas, we need a Ribble. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm remembering, again, I don't mean to sound super stupid bias because i'm just talking about my own episode but it's just like those are the ones that are most ingrained in my head but the on the mirror where um uh zero and rock talk the elevator opens and they're going into a different universe and they talk about oh like you know let captain tuvix know and then when zero comes back at the end it was like oh i was just getting used to like the fusion cuisine i think that was probably my favorite (laughs) Yeah, no, I yeah, that was brilliant. A universe where Neelix's food is good. Yeah. <laughs> no, because he's he. Of course, he would know fusion cuisine. It would be the best. Yeah. Um, I suppose the only only other one for me is Janeway's vest. Yeah. The, uh, the mirror you're talking about? Yeah. No. Um. So she, um she was in um the under vest from the uniform yes but what she, um the voyager episode where is, she's walking around the gray, with the, the, gray the the yes uh, but i can't remember the gray. name of the episode it's the I brain can't, fart i've yeah. seen the picture though i know which one you're talking about but yeah the live yeah year she of hell a few, though. she did it year of hell yeah year of hell okay. that's that's what it is so yeah it's the year of hell vest um okay fine and then i've got one last question then what is your favorite memory from working on the show until now because I'm going to leave that open because there is going to be season three. Yes, there mm. is. We have got planes on standby. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hundreds uh, of them. I mean, yeah. like... You know, it could be so... anything. It could be it could be a scene that you've animated or uh, written, or it could just be crew moments. It could be anything like that. Well, I've got a crew moment. Jason, you want me to go first? Please. Okay. So... Because I was lucky enough to be involved starting in season one, I remember it's kind of a two-parter memory. It's the first time we went into the big theater to look at the very first animatic of the first Mm. two episodes, which the first two episodes, as you can imagine, got a lot of working on because that everybody was finding like the rhythm, the pacing, the style, everything. So I remember going in and watching the very first animatic of the very first two episodes and then a a while down the road coming in and seeing the finished product of the very first two episodes in the theater and just like being able to 
watch something from, you know, all the way back to like little notes scribbles on the whiteboard to coming to all fruition and just all the people that that represented and all of the work that that represented. That was a really cool, that was one of my favorite moments for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anytime you get to see like the first screening of the first thing with all the sound and all that stuff, like no matter what you could work on anything and you see it and you're like, Oh my God, like, how do we, how do we do it? But like, so I, I think I told this story on the first time I was on the podcast yeah uh, back in the day when I when uh, I was working at foundation um uh, I <laughs> like there was the deep space nine rap party in Hollywood and the the bosses weren't going like the the heads of the studio weren't going so I got to pretend to be one of the bosses of foundation <laughs> and got into the rap party of deep space nine and got and like what was walking around looking at all the tr- i was like oh my god what am i doing here i'm 19 20 or I, maybe i was 21 at the, i can't remember 20 at the time and like at one point i felt these hands on my shoulders and i looked around i looked back and it was michael dorn like put his hands on me and just goes ha, 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 ha. you know and i would just i was like what the fuck is going on this is awesome <laughs> And I remember seeing, like, I remember seeing, uh, like, oh, no, I remember seeing, like, some people there, and I just was like, oh, my God. And then, cut like, cut to late, it's like, the benefits of working on Star Trek are, you know, we went to Star Trek Day, and, you know, I, did, I didn't have the courage to go um, talk to Kate Mulgrew, but being two feet from her, you know, yeah. seeing, uh, seeing Patrick Stewart there seeing um you know the new ahura seeing you know like every all these people there and you feel like you're a part of it uh you know and you and even if you're like yeah i'm i'm animating on this thing and i'm working on prodigy you still felt like you were part of the star trek family um which was it's just a it's just such a good feeling you know uh to kind of feel like you are adding to the canon of of trek yep. to feel like you 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 belong and your name is in the credits and you you have contributed um is to me one of the most rewarding uh feelings so for sure kind of, yeah so this hopefully one day both me and mike too will get that feeling why not yeah. that's the dream <laughs> yeah in, in, any way you can you know i mean but it the, the trek is so much about the fans yeah. and it's so much about the the community and so much about the diversity of the cast and crew and everybody so uh yeah just the, the whole experience is rewarding but feeling like feeling feeling like you're adding to the the history and lore of it is yeah. is special yeah i mean let's face yeah. it Star Trek fans are the best fans. You tell me another show where we've campaigned to get a show back and won. Mm -hmm. We've campaigned for an actor to get its own show and won. (laughs) It doesn't happen. So, you know, Star Trek fans are the best fans. Yeah, they really are some of the best fans. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Goodwood, do you have any questions? Oh. Because I know we're pushing it close to time for Jason. Uh, I, yeah. I've got no questions. It's just I, I was going to ask how would how you know how did it feel to see your name in the credits of a Star Trek show? Which for me, if if it was Mike One and Mike Two, and that happened, I, I'm still convinced that one day we'll just turn up to LA or Toronto and just find our way on in the set, and yeah. then just we just act like we belong there. Uh, but I'm petitioning yeah, the nice people at um, Lower Decks to try and create some uh, virtual characters of me and show and just throw yeah. them in the background. I said, you somewhere. just put a new nose appliance on and just yeah. walk in, <laughs> you know, build out your brows. And yeah, put a spoon on, on your head, spoon on your head, just I'm a Cardassian. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yes, Kim Kardashian. Yeah. Yes. Oh no. Oh no. But yes, yeah, so you sort of answered the question that it, it must be for the first time. It must have been a surreal experience to just see your name in the credits 
of a Star Trek show. Yeah, um, absolutely. I know I've I've had friends who have been hardcore Star Trek fans all their life and then have been background actors on the show. And yeah. they say it is the most surreal yeah. experience to, to actually be in that world. Yeah. Um, and it must have been an overwhelming feeling for you both. Especially uh, to me as an artist. I, I, yes. I, I was lucky enough to be, I don't know, I can't remember. I think I was in the credits as a tape operator back then. And I was part of an Emmy award winning team for the snow crash episode oh. of Voyager. Yeah. Um, I, I was added. I don't know why I was added to the Emmy <laughs> list. I Take it. didn't deserve it, <laughs> but I, I sure enough, FTP footage from <laughs> Paramount and back and forth. So God damn it. I earned it. Yep. Um, so, I mean, that was cool 25 years ago. And then, but to, you know, to, to see it now, it just, yeah. it hits differently. Yeah. And it, it felt fantastic for sure. Yeah. And, it's pretty epic. Know, and also just working with such a great crew and, Aaron and all the writers and every everybody were just so awesome and cool and uh, you know appreciative of of the process and what we were all doing you know yeah um, so yeah. I don't know it's just fantastic all around yeah awesome yeah well look, it was both of you part of it thank you so much for joining us this has been Absolutely. incredible one of my favorite Star Trek shows I could talk about it all day but I know Jason yeah. you have to drop off so. We will end it there for everybody watching and listening at home. Remember you can catch up with more clone star podcast at our website, clonestarpod.com. But until next time, live long and prosper. <laughs>